Hi, everyone. Very good afternoon from the United Nations University, Bonn. My name is Himanshu Shekhar, and I work for United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security. We are very happy to welcome you to the last webinar of the Climate Academy 2021 series. And today we would be looking at way forward. How can we enhance the application, uptake in mainstreaming, as well as learning from nature-based solution to reduce vulnerability from climate change in urban area? We brought this series over the last five days in our collaboration through our collaboration with Munich Ray Foundation. And this whole event has also been in collaboration with the UN Climate Change Secretariat, UNFCCC. Today, we have an exciting event in front of us. Um, over the last past days, we looked at what are some of the challenges, what are some of the best practices. We looked at certain areas where we feel as a group that there could be there are challenges. Some of these challenges cut across different programs, not just nature-based solutions. For example, sustainable funding. How do we ensure that we go beyond the piecemeal funding for a couple of years and ensure that the project is sustainable in the short, in the near and long term? We also looked at the challenges of, for example, space. Our cities are becoming more and more dense in many parts of the world which often could be in contradiction to the need demand for space to implement nature-based solutions. So there are many stumbling blocks. There are also very um, amazing opportunities. And more than anything, this program is rightly called the People's Pathway to Participatory uh, Climate Action. So how can we make our planning process, our implementation process very participatory? With this, allow me to introduce the program and the panel for today. We have Okay, just give me a second. I should be able to share my own screen. Um, okay. Yeah, so I hope you can see my screen now. So my name, <coughs> sorry. My name is Himanshu Shekhar. I work for the United Nations University. The very first speaker we are very excited to have with us from the Nature Conservancy is Fernando Secaria, who leads the Coastal Risk and Resilience Strategy in Mexico and Northern Central America. Um, in Latin America region for the conservancy. He works with the private sector, academia, and government to mainstream use of natural system for coastal production, developing restoration guide, and financial instrument. This particular cross-actor, cross-sectoral perspective is precisely what we need. And today, Fernando has uh, agreed to share some insights from the coral reef protection in Mexico. So thanks a lot, Fernando, for joining us today. The next speaker we have on board is Marcela de Souza. She's the director for Center for Resilience Studies at Watershed Organization Trust in India. Marcela has a background in medical science and she has been working with community-based participation at the WTR and across the world for a long time. Her work focuses on providing evidence-based lesson from practice to policy. And this exactly what we also have in mind through academic programs. So thanks a lot, Marcela. You would be talking about the role of so how do we mainstream, how do we facilitate effective and inclusive participation, particularly looking at the gender dimension as well as socially vulnerable groups. So thanks a lot. Then we would have inputs from Dr. Coco Warner. Coco has been a strong supporter of the program. She works for United uh, UN Climate Change Secretariat, UNFCCC, and she's among the most prominent women in the climate change debate. So Coco, thanks a lot for your continuous support. We are very happy to have your support all the time. And you would be talking about the pol policy perspective. I would also like to welcome the deputy director of my own institute, Dr. Zita Sabeswari, who leads uh, who heads the Environmental Vulnerability and Ecosystem Division at uh, United Nations University, EHS. And she's also an IPCC lead author. So Zita, you would be talking about the larger perspective of nature-based solution and climate action. And finally, we would also hear from Dr. Simone Sandholz, who leads the Urban Futures and Sustainability Transformation Program at UNUHS. Simone, you have a strong background and exposure uh, experience in the urban planning field, in urban trans, uh, transformation field, and we would be hearing the exact application <coughs> of nature-based solution challenges and what could be the inspiring pathways from your side. And then finally, we are very thankful to Christian Barthel from the foundation, from the Munich Re Foundation for all the support that we have continuously received. And Christian would be providing us concluding remarks and word of thanks. So with this, without any further delay from my side, I would like to first of all invite Fernando. So Fernando, please um, 
take us through. I hope you can share your screen and uh, we listen to you. In the meanwhile, I would like to request my um, everyone in the attendance that feel free to pose your questions. It would be very helpful if you can put your questions through Q&A box. This event is <clears throat> being recorded and this event is also being live streamed on our on UNUHS Facebook uh, page. So thanks a lot for your cooperation and we look forward to a very nice event. Fernando, please take us through. So good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, sorry, or night. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to share our experience here in Mexico. Um, so I'm gonna start here telling you about our initiative to create this post-storm response and reef insurance in, in the Mexican Caribbean. So First Nature Conservancy is an entity that has been around for 70 years now and have a experience of working in 79 countries in all continents. We have several strategies. Uh, one of them is tackle climate change precisely. And within that is that we have this coastal risk and resilience initiative where we work and this project is, is part of that. That initiative, what aims is to reduce the risk to coastal communities, infrastructure and economy by using precisely these natural systems for coastal protection in like, nat like reefs, dunes and mangroves, uh, mostly here in this area but also in the Northern Hemisphere, it's more like uh, wetlands and, and, and kelp forests and, and other systems. No? We have several projects in terms of the uh, reef and the tropical systems in the coastal areas, uh, all over the Caribbean and, and Hawaii, in the case of the Americas, but also in the Asia Pacific, uh, mostly. No? And so today I'm going to talk about uh, Mexico and Mexican Caribbean which is an area, as you many know, uh, we have uh, the Mesoamerican Reef, which is a 1,000 kilometers long reef crest that protects and provides a lot of uh, the economy, sustains the economy of the area. And it's also hit by hurricanes. We suffer every year, uh, we're in the path of the hurricane systems in the Atlantic. But these reefs are very important and the reefs and the mangroves and the reef lagoons pr provide the coastal protection but also sustain the economy, as I mentioned, we here in Mexico have a $12 billion in tourism industry. It's the largest uh, tourism uh, center in Mexico. Um, but also this, this reef, the Mesoamerican Reef provides coastal protection. We have modeled the um, losses that are avoided by these reefs and it accounts for almost 9% of the build capitals. In, during the storm. So it provides a really important uh, and it's proven this protection that the reef provides. We can see here when the hurricane, last year we were hit by three hurricanes, uh, only in, in a few months time. And the areas where we don't have reefs, they were they suffer more damage than, than the areas uh, with reefs, but that's also modern. Right? So reefs are important, but the bad news, as we may know for, about reefs, they are being destroyed everywhere. And here in Mexico, we have lost 80% of life coral covers in the 70s, when we began uh, with scientific methods to, to record the life coral cover here. Um, there are many reasons for that, um, water pollution, diseases, bleaching events, now that is increasing with climate change, but also uh, for hurricanes. And this is very important because hurricanes cause a major damage to, to the reefs. They can cause in a few hours uh, a loss of 25 or 35% of the losses of the light coral cover um, for, caused by hurricanes above category three. No? So I want, I want to emphasize that in the loss from the for, for reefs uh, for all other causes is 2% 2 per, 2 annually. Um, but it can triple if those areas are hit by hurricanes. So in, in terms of the hurricanes are really a major uh, threat to reefs uh, here in the Caribbean. But the good news, maybe there's always a, a good side of this, is that we can reduce the, the damages to, to the reefs by acting after the, the storm. And there has been some experience before, but now this is the first time that we create this capacity at a scale that we can do and uh, um, 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 act in several areas across the reef because obviously there are uh, hundreds of kilometers that are damaged when a hurricane hits the area. It's not just one, one site. 
So we have developed this technology. We, we have now a, a protocol and guidelines for how to do it. So how do you do that? How do you do implement a response uh, after the UE came? Um, to manage the risk, we need three, actually four components. One is governance. I mean, who is leading the, the, the action previous and after the UE came? That's very, very critical as we know. Uh, we need a response protocol and what are the actions, activities, who is going to be involved doing what. That's really important and has to be very precise because it's an emergency situation. Third, we need the brigades. So we need people who actually go into the water and do the work. It's like the, the first <laughs> responders that needs to go into the work. And then you need financial mechanisms. We need to, to pay for this because this response is not, uh, I mean, everything costs money, but a response of this scale is expensive, no? So I'm gonna talk about the financial mechanism in this presentation. Uh, who can contribute to this uh, response? First, the uh, most important and the most uh, concerned people are the beneficiaries from the reef. As I mentioned before, this area uh, supports the tourism industry in Mexico and so tour operators, hotel owners, coastal property owners are the ones who are really concerned and they have been contributed well, at a certain scale, no? Uh, sorry, I hear also the entities that are in charge of the reefs, like the protected areas uh, entity and the Ministry of Environment. The another option is that the government for other sources that they have from like roads or schools or uh, uh, other subsidies that the government provides, they can redirect the funding to the response in case of an emergency. But also the important thing, and this is what we are uh, here today, is uh, go to the market and transfer the risk, my insurance. I'm going to tell you about it. And then the traditional conservation funding. So out of these op and several options, the idea is to have a mix. When you are addressing risks, you don't have only one instrument to find a response. You, you blend some of these instruments in, into one system. And this is the, the, the importance of insurance is a great uh, response is a great instrument, but it has to be along with other things, no? So how do we see this is uh, we have several scenarios uh, of damages to the reef, like let's say categories of hurricanes. And in, in any case, there is always some resources that need to come from the local, local people, local stakeholders. And we have the experience of people just providing boats, providing diving services, food, uh, and some volunteer work to conduct the, the response. But then when they, you have scenarios of uh, higher damage, you need an, an, uh, an extra fund. So we set up an emergency fund uh, to address those, uh, those needs. Then you buy an insurance, but then that insurance is also bought for uh, cases where you have, a, we call severe or catastrophic uh, cases, no, hurricanes. Uh, you don't buy the insurance for the lower or, or more frequent uh, storms. And there is always important to notice that there is some areas of risk not covered. And it will be maybe too expensive to actually buy an insurance uh, that covers all, uh, more frequent events or to have a larger um, payout for the event. So this is the different instruments that we are using uh, here in Mexico. So how do we deal to design insurance? I mean, when do we need to to, um, the, to receive the money from the insurance company to actually do something. So thanks God we have, uh, uh, thanks a lot of, I will say the scientists here, we have a lot of information and this is a, a graph where you can see the hurricane uh, wind speed in the X uh, axis and the light coral cover loss or sometimes increase after hurricanes. Um, so this is based in science for the 25 years of data from, from the Caribbean. So we can see here that, that there is a drop in the light coral cover, uh, and especially when we have when we hit the hundred uh, knots uh, wind speed, uh, which is more or less the category three hurricanes. Before that, you may suffer damages. You may also have some uh, benefits because the water will be clean, it will be fresh, uh, cool. Um, so actually, we know that beyond hundred knots definitely we will, be, we will have damages. So we need funding for that. Before that, maybe you can use the emergency fund or the local resources for that. No? The other important piece of the insurance is um, 
the polygon. So what is the area that is going to be covered? Uh, as you can see here in the picture of the right, we have the coral cover. This is just the main areas of, of reefs in, in red. And, but the hurricane, as we can see here in the left, the, this is the size, the average size of hurricanes in this area. So they can be quite large. So even you, you are a certain distance from the hurricane, you will be hit. So based on analysis that we did, we found out that 60 kilometers was a reasonable um, buffer around the, the coral reefs that we wanted to protect. So if a hurricane passes by a uh, 65 kilometer distance, it will still trigger the insurance and, and pay that. And so we decided to have this uh, parametric insurance. Now, actually I didn't update this because we have bought it in 2019. I mean, we, I, I wanna explain who, who bought it in 2020. And, and now also this year, 2021, we is the same third year we bought the insurance, no? So in general, it's a, uh, an average, uh, a coverage uh, between $2 million and $5 million. Um, that also depends on how much funding is available to buy the insurance in terms of the, the cost of the policy. The insurance has, uh, uh, is triggered by different wind speeds and the payout is corresponding to that. Uh, the first is, uh, trigger is 100 knots and above, and we pay 40% 40, 40 of this amount. If we are above 130 knots, it will be paying twice as that. And then in the very catastrophic events of 160 knots, which is category five uh, hurricanes, we'll get the 100% payout. And this is obviously because the more intense the hurricane, the more damages, so more funding will be needed to, to restore the, the reef after that. And here we can see last year when we uh, were hit by Hurricane Delta in October in 2020, in 2020 uh, this is the area where the, the hurricane was, come, was approaching as category four, but it decreased intensity and when reached the coastline. Coast, coastline and it dropped to category two. But just before entering the polygon, it uh, measured the wind speed of 100 knots. And so it got triggered. So if, if the measurement had been just a few kilometers away, it will, it will not get paid. But in this case, yeah, it did. So uh, it proved that the polygon was in the right <laughs> distance and, and size. So we received the funding uh, from the insurance company. It was $850,000 because it came into this category, 40% of the payout. Um, so who bought uh, and how do we buy the insurance? We set up, I mean, the government of Quintana Roo, uh, which is the state government uh, here in, in this area of Mexico, established a trust fund, which has different uh, um, sources of income, is uh, contribution from the hotel industry and uh, taxes, there is a fee for the property owners that uh, comes into the trust fund. The idea is to support the long-term restoration of the reef, but also coastal management. And uh, there are different um, objectives of this uh, trust fund. One of them was to buy an insurance, uh, not only to cover the, the reef, but also the, the beaches because they are also damaged by the storms. And obviously if we have a, a hurricane category four and five, in this case, now we change that to category, to include also category three hurricanes. It will trigger the insurance and receive the payout. And if we got the payout, then we can launch the response and, and provi provide the funding. No? So, I, so as I mentioned, we got this um, impact on hurricane uh, Delta to trigger the insurance, but also we were impacted by Gamma and Zeta all in, in laps of so like five weeks uh, here. And the payout, as I mentioned, and we have trained uh, 120 people now, 120 divers to conduct this uh, response. This is very important. And now we have the pandemic of COVID is very clear for us. We, we need more than the money. Um, this time? Yeah. I mean, if you can wrap up in next 90 seconds, that would be great. Yeah, actually, this is the last slide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so we, we did this, we received the money and we, I mean, the brigades work very, very nicely. They, 
governance worked pretty, pretty well. And we were able to stabilize 2,000 colonies uh, and big colonies and then a lot of fragments. And just briefly, this year we were also hit by the hurricane grace, was like a month, last month. And that didn't trigger the, the insurance, but the other financial mechanisms were in place and we were able to also launch a response. Uh, and they are still working because it was very recent this hurricane. Um, and we are working on that. Um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Fernando. This definitely was very insightful for me, for sure, and I guess also for a lot of attendees, because seeing how exactly, you know, we talk about the role of private party, we talk about the market-driven mechanisms, and how exactly do they work? It's yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry for that. So thanks a lot, Fernando. Thanks for your presentation. It was very insightful. We often talk about market-driven mechanisms. We all are in together. And you provided a very insightful understanding of how one particular private actor can uh, you know, contribute to that. There are definitely many questions come in. And I also have a few questions from my side. But we take, at, take one. And we hope to come back to you along with all the panelists towards the end of the event. And I hope uh, we also can see the questions in the Q&A tab. So if I take one particular question, uh, that is the very first question is that it is interesting to see that the government funding is redirected after an event. Is there a deliberate mechanism to secure fund for preparation before event that is led by government? For example, some sort of climate bond? No, what we have here is um, the, the, the funding from for the marine protected areas that within their operations is the one that are actually maintaining the system. I mean, the governance, we need to keep training or train the brigades and everything is in place. So that's the regular funding because that has to happen every year. In case of an emergency, there is a national disaster fund that may support these activities. But the idea of this fund is to support mostly, you know, human impacts. I mean, to houses, to infrastructure, and so that's why we have to come come out, come out with these uh, mechanisms to support nature because that was not originally covered in the national fund. Thanks a lot, Fernando. I, I keep one question sort of parked with you. We would come to this towards the second uh, half of this presentation. And that is that that is about how do you assess the impact of the work you do? How do we see that the impact of you know, insurance make a difference? So it's the third question that is coming from Dirk. You can also see it in the Q&A panel. But for now, we move to Marcella for the next presentation. And Marcella, you would be talking about the role of gender mainstreaming, the how, how do we ensure participatory plan um, climate action? So Marcella, please take us through. Thank you. In the meanwhile, if I can just make a small uh, um, announcement, particularly for Coco. Coco, uh, we do see you, but somehow we, due to some technical reason, I'm not able to bring you, we are not able to bring you to the panel list. If you can simply join using the link that was separately sent to you just right now, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sorry, Marcella, please continue. So, share the screen. Uh, I can see your screen. I do see the video. Okay, uh, you see the, okay. It's not being played yet. No, no, it's not being played. I think I have a problem here. It's to go right to the top. Uh, just one second. Uh, no worries, please take your time. Yeah. It was working 10 minutes, uh, half an hour before, so it would work. I know. Now. It definitely would. Share. Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to give this, uh, to share uh, the experiences of gender and social inclusion for adaptation. Very briefly about my organization. We are 30 years old, uh, and this is the area where we are working mainly only in India. And uh, so far we have reached out to regenerate about 1.43 million hectares and to many villages in, in uh, nine states in the country. We are very active in seven states. 
The approach while we began it earlier was on watershed development on a landscape basis, but more gradually we realized that we needed to work on an ecosystem-based adaptation approach where land and water with the local community play an active role. Of course, it is then agriculture with livelihoods, health and sanitation and women's empowerment. As I shared, this work we began was way back in 1993. We had started off as the coordinator together with the National Bank for Agriculture Development, as the coordinator for the Inter-German Watershed Development Program. Around 2001 and two, when we had almost about nine years or 10 years of work of implementation of watershed development with various NGOs, we decided to have an assessment done just to see whether the expectations we had were being achieved. What we did realize was that the regeneration of the ecosystems of the degraded lands was very obvious. It was during a year of, uh, sorry, it was during a period of two or three years of very low rainfall. When one of the farmers mentioned, uh, or when we were visiting one of the farmers, he said, thank you so much for this particular program. The, our village is not facing as much drought as that of the other villages. So all these impacts were so visible. And in fact, even today, they are very visible. We have recently done an economic assessment um, of the exposed projects. However, in this particular assessment that we did in 2001 2 we had decided that we wanted a very critical uh, assessment. We did not share the findings with anyone with the, for, the, uh, for the only purpose of having a very critical view so that we could make the changes. We didn't want to be biased by having to share it. And what we found was that there were gaps and these gaps on the social fabric actually surfaced. Here we found that those who were better off were getting more uh, benefits as compared to those who were not better off and particularly the small and marginal and the livestock owners. They were getting benefits much more as compared to before, but not as the others. However, the other thing what we realized was that prior to the program, the villagers did not know one another. They interacted only within the family and the community. But at this time, they knew one another. The women had said they didn't even know the names of one another. Not now. Now there was a bonding between them, but these gaps surfaced. What we realized was that the attitudinal change that we expected was not, uh, was not uh, uh, prominent. And so we realized also that if we have to address this challenge of getting everybody to address climate change adaptation, we needed the entire community together, women and men of all castes, of all classes, particularly the marginalized and those who are normally left out, engaging them in governance, in benefit sharing. And for this, we needed capacity building. Other gleanings from the study, what we decided as we had initially in intended was to relook at our approach. Look more critically at the chinks that had become visible in the social fabric. We realized we needed to study the gaps with objectivity and depth, and depth, the what, the why, in order to come out with how to address it and how to take it sustainably forward. One of the very great learnings we had in this process was, do not be afraid of looking at the, the failures. If something doesn't work, then change the approach. What we also realized was, it's very easy to flaunt the best practices. We happily document them. The question is, are these really replicable? Probably we need to look more critically at that which did not succeed, 
because we have the answers in that in those components. This has been an extremely great learning for us. And we also realize, and we tell our team today, we will be a failure if we repeat mistakes. Based on this entire experience, we modified our approach, particularly the social development aspect. We came up with what we internally call the Vasundra approach, which puts an inclusive community, which is proportionately represented objectively done with the community, they, this decision-making body is right at the center. What we also realize is we need to ask questions. We do not, uh, even the answers, even though the answers are obvious. What we also realized is that very often it happens when, when the youngsters are there, when I was young, we always thought we knew a lot. What we learned in textbooks, today I realize they are half-truths. If we go and listen to the people, if we hear them, if we try to see it from their eyes, we can be surprised. So therefore, we need to be willing to be surprised, to go on an adventure with them, to find the diamonds in the dust, to find unplanned alternatives emerging from them. And now I would like to share with you a little video. It was a, an experience we had a few years ago of how we need to engage the local community in the whole process, in the development process. This was our earlier local. Since more than a decade, Jalna district and the Maratwada region have been facing recurring droughts. Groundwater levels rapidly and steadily drop, mainly due to its unrestricted extraction, the shift to cash crops, expanding urbanization and industrialization. Meeting the Jalna water needs sustainably as everywhere else is extremely complex. It is beyond the capacity of any single agency. It necessitates the active engagement of all stakeholders. Watershed Organization Trust organized a series of workshops based on the transformative scenario planning process. Stakeholders from across the spectrum came together to discuss the possible scenarios of water in rural Jalna in 2030. The important issues raised were, can we possibly predict the water situation in the future? How will the climate behave? How can individual household needs and developmental concerns work together to tackle the water crisis? Based on high uncertainty and extensive impactfulness, the two key drivers identified were collective action and implementation of government programs. Merging these two drivers, four possible scenarios appear. 3. Ineffective implementation of government programs with strong collective action. 4. Effective implementation of government programs and strong collective action. Depending on the behavior of the two key drivers, participants visualized what the four likely situations could be. Scenarios were developed through models created. Each scenario was further elaborated into stories. Title of the story We are almost there. Title of the story One step forward, two back. In 2017, rural Jalna faces water shortages which badly affect the rural community. Agriculture and drinking water needs rely heavily on bore wells. Rich farmers deepen their bore wells beyond the permitted depth of 200 feet. Reflecting on the stories, 
in groups the participants discussed and noted down the opportunities and threats to the water situation in jalna together they visualized in sketches their dream of the desired water situation the participants realized that the first step towards achieving the desired future is to design a road map on the basis of this road map two sets of actions are identified what to avoid and what to do some startling facts surface particularly as to what should be avoided everyone present expressed their commitment to share this experience in their villages and in neighboring villages conducted water budgeting trainings for gram panchayat members of many villages the code drive visual integrator 3d tool was used to bring together 14 villages that share a common aquifer to be motivated to judiciously manage their groundwater resource पाणी व्यवस्थापनाबद्दल आता मुख्य कोणत्या गोष्टीकडे लक्ष द्यायला पाहिजे ते आम्ही व्यवस्थित समजलेलं आहे आपापल्या शेतातच थोडे थोडे बांध घातले पाहिजे थोडे असे नाले केले पाहिजे मंथ्स फॉलोइंग दीस इंटरव्हेंशन्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स शेअर देयर रिफ्लेक्शन्स पाण्याचा ताळेबंद म्हणजे तुमच्या गावावर पडणारा पाऊस त्याचं कॅल्क्युलेशन जर केलं सर तर तेवढं पाणी वाहून जातं हे त्या दिवशी कळलं आम्हाला तोपर्यंत आम्हाला माहित नव्हतं की आमच्यावर किती पाणी आमच्या गावावरती किती पाऊस पडतोय आणि किती वाहून जाते पाण्याचं ताळेबंद कसा शेतकऱ्यांना समजून सांगता येईल आणि पाण्याचं महत्व कसं समजून सांगता येईल हे ग्रामीण पातळीवर बऱ्याचशा शासनाद्वारे एन जी ओद्वारे कार्यक्रम राबवले जात आहे द प्रोसेस ऑफ मेकिंग रुरल जालना वॉटर सिक्युअर बाय टू थाउजंड थर्टी हॅज बिगन विथ द फर्स्ट फ्यू लिटर्स ऑफ वॉटर बिंग प्रोटेक्टेड द जर्नी इज चॅलेंजिंग बट अचिवेबल It requires a focus on the 2030 dream and the partnership and efforts of all stakeholders politicians government corporates in fact all water users people know that unless they come together and take the first step the security of their water resources and their future is at stake I leave you to draw the inferences from what you have said uh, seen in this short film. I'd like to share with you what have been our experiences over here. We realize that very often when we come with a lot of uh, you know bringing the scientists together with the uh, government officials uh, with the media with local communities with the people of all categories and ngos and when we come together in a playway method in a workshop automatically we keep behind all our profiles and we come there as citizens it was something that was very enriching for us and together we could then look out for what um, uh, potential situ- uh, um, solutions could be to our problem this process that we started continues uh, continues through the various capacity building events that we continue in the villages because it is a long term process what did we realize also is that in recent years there's so much investments being put into climate change the question is are we getting the desired outcomes and what could be the reasons we realize that most of the projects are ranging from 2 to 3 years some of them are short as one year what is expected of us from the uh, practitioners is quantifiable results which are measurable which can show a lot of inverted commas success but can we achieve the desired impacts within a short time frame when we are addressing this issue of climate change the key for, uh, learning that we have is besides understanding the science of it we all have to work towards a behavioral change we are all equally victims of being of being caught up in the in the way we have worked before in our aspirations we need this behavioral change 
We need an attitudinal change and we need a longer duration to work towards the sustainability. Most of all, we need to work in partnerships, all stakeholders coming in from our areas of strength because we, together we can weave solutions. And the lessons we have learned continue. What we realize is that when any program or any organization is successful, we need to assume that this success will not continue because the context is constantly changing. There are new policies, there are new approaches, there are new problems. And new people come into the, uh, into the experience with their own life experience. And therefore, inclusiveness, gender and equity needs to be continuously monitored and we need an objective way to systematize it. We need also to keep asking questions, to have an observant ear, uh, eye and an ear to the ground. And what we need most of all is to look at our work, not just as a job to be done, but rather as a fulfillment of one's mission, because it is a journey of continuous learning and a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marcella. That definitely was very interesting. And at the same time, it took me back a bit to memory lane, but I must say that my experience in the past had been more in the urban area and seeing that almost everything we talk in the classroom, almost everything we talk in many seminars over and over again, being practiced in some rural countryside, you know, where we not often associate with these sort of participatory mechanism to be implement, implemented in such a great detail is just amazing, just marvelous and inspirational. And that's precisely the message we are getting also from our attendees. So thanks a lot for sharing it. It's uh, like seeing it happening in the rural area we obviously know there are cases happening in the urban area as well. And then for me, the most fascinating part was that how do you take the climate science or the projection, you know, and then how do you, in a sense, break it down in more implementable, first understandable, then manageable, then implementable blocks. So that was fascinating. Thanks a lot for that. There, um, one question is coming, obviously, how can we know more about the work you are doing, the work your organization is doing, what are the resources that we have at our disposal? So if you can share certain links, including to this video, that would be very helpful. And we get one question that I am very interested to know as well is that, the representation of the female um, community, I would say, or, or female participant was very significant. Was there any special strategy did you employ or it's a bit contrary to, you know, what we think about participatory process that often it's difficult to get the voice of marginalized community, including the female um, participants. How did you manage that? Okay, it doesn't automatically happen. We need to consistently keep an eye for it because as I said earlier, new people come in and they forget about uh, you know, engaging women. But what we do is we have made it into a process to engage women very actively at the rural areas. So in the, in the governance at the local level, uh, we have uh, the, an equitable representation based on the proportionate number of people in the castes and communities. And we have a representation which should be uh, at least, uh, you know, 40, 40 to 50 percent of women represented. So that is put in as a system so that we don't forget it. When it comes to uh, newer people coming into it, we constantly need a reminder, please get the women put, uh, into it. We've had a learning recently where we took a whole water stewardship approach in the first experience without a single woman because the people thought that the women don't have time, so we don't engage them. But when we did us, we sent the team back for a study, and when they found that women could be active participants, but we needed to make modification in the timings of the way we do our work, in the time when we go to the village, make it more conducive for women, it works. So these are the things we realize we constantly need to go back and see and check for ourselves. Thank you so Thank much, you. Marcella. Definitely well noted. And exactly this is where the experience lies. Thanks again. And if you can share certain resources in the chat link, uh, that sure. would be very helpful. With this, uh, now we would like to go to um, Coco. Coco, first of all, thanks for joining as a panelist. 
Uh, today is our concluding part of this year's Climate Academy series open events. We would like to focus like we working in the UN system, particularly from your day to day experience of being involved in the climate change policy making. What, where do you see the role for active participation when we talk about the non state actor, I don't know if this is something that you would like to address right away, or you would have another insights and inspirations for enhancing climate action, be it even within the parties in the UN system. Coco, please take us through. Sorry to interrupt you, Mancho. I just saw, I think that Coco left the panel. I assume oh. there are some technical issues. Let me just check. Okay, no, uh, we just had Coco there. So I'm really sorry for this. Um, okay, I see Coco joining again. Uh, I ex would like, yeah, I seek for your understanding. So Coco, do we have you back with us? Yes, beg your pardon. Sorry, I dropped off there for a moment. No worries. Um, do I need to repeat my question? Uh, should I yes. repeat it quickly? So thanks a lot for all your support throughout the program, you know, before in the preparation phase, and obviously we would be working to, uh, together towards the output. Today is the concluding session, and in a sense, we need to see where in your day-to-day -day experience, as someone working at the UN Climate Change Secretariat, someone who has very sound experience of the climate change policy making, where do you see either as your wish list or your observation, the key for enhanced climate action? It could be at the non-parties level, if you want to focus there, it could be at the parties level. Where do you feel, you know, few things that can enhance our climate action? Yeah, um, well, there are maybe a couple of different layers to that. Many of the challenges that we have today um, with climate change, obviously, because that's one thing that we're really looking at, but also lots of other challenges have to do with the way that we interact with each other and with nature. That sounds almost like a cliche, but really, if we could reorient and, and understand how do we respect each other and include each other, um, how do we do that at a very practical level, at a community level, and then all the way up? And um, how do we also respect and value nature? Um, right now, society tends to interact with nature as a resource. And we gobble it up and throw it away. Often it lands in the ocean. And um, that may have been adequate as a, as a way to, to interact with nature when we weren't so many people. But now we have very complex societies um, and a sense that everyone has some bare minimum needs for survival, let alone human aspiration. And that requires us as human beings to really reorient the way that we interact with these, yeah, with nature. And um, find a way as a as a set of cultures across the world to understand that we're part of nature we're not apart from nature and if we don't get that right um, nature upon which we depend for our survival won't accommodate us in the ways that it has in the past so that's a philosophical again i, I know that i've repeated that this week but that's the task ahead where do the climate negotiations come in well in order to act in these earth systems, in complex human organizations, we have to coordinate. And that's what our work at the UNFCCC is all about. We have an overarching objective of our convention, which is to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change um, and interference with the earth's atmosphere. In that article two of the convention, and I know that I started off with that on Monday, but Article 2 is about avoiding dangerous anthropogenic climate change and doing so in ways, in, there are three parameters. One, that ecosystems have sufficient time to adapt. Two, that food production is not disrupted. And three, that economic and social development are not disrupted. And that's been our aim these past almost 30 years. And nature plays a key role in all of those things. If one wanted or could plant all of Australia or 
all of India and China just with trees. Some scientists suggest that might be what it takes to sequester carbon and stay below 1.5 degrees or maybe below two degrees. But obviously there are a lot of people living in those places that I just mentioned and the soils and climates don't necessarily support old growth, not tree plantations, old growth forests and grasslands. Um, so that brings us to a lot of trade-offs and questions. And again, the climate negotiations are a place where countries come together and try and work out those trade-offs and try and work out um, broad aspirations as well as rules. And it's very difficult. Um, I could name a couple of issues that we're going to be tackling again in Glasgow in just a few weeks. That might be a bit too much detail. Maybe I'll leave that if, any, if anyone wants to talk about that in the question and, and answers. Um, but maybe just two more comments to give you a sense. We're trying to coordinate. And a lot of that discussion directly or indirectly has to do with how humans interact with nature and what are the rules. Um, with the atmosphere, it's this typical public good. We all need it. We all benefit from it. And no one can really prevent um, abuse of that shared value and that shared resource. Only countries can do that. And so the UNFCCC gathers countries around the table and provides a space and, and a little bit of you know, coaching, not coaching, but, but setting the agenda and helping countries find ways to manage these shared um, benefits that we enjoy with and from nature. Okay, so there are a lot of, a lot of issues and it's very difficult. That said, this is something that humans are actually quite good at. We're good at adapting. We're good at watching what other people do and following that. Marcella, I was so impressed by your presentation. I found it just really compelling. I would love to learn about the failures, of course, also the successes, <laughs> but we watch each other. And typically what we do is we watch what others people do and then we often copy that. That's a huge potential for us. And we know how to coordinate. Some of the best things that humans have achieved together, they've achieved because of also the, the Cancun Coral Reef Insurance Program. Really interesting. It's because we all come together, bring our smarts and our insights and create um, ways to manage together. And that, that does give me hope. It's difficult. We have a huge role ahead. And maybe the last thing that I would say is that we're a community that as much as the press and as much as, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations says, now's the time, there's no more time. Um, of course, time does go on and we will continue to build and continue to work and continue to try and find rules that we can abide by together. So um, again, this is a, a milestone in our journey together, but we have a lot of work to do together ahead. Thanks a lot, Coco. That definitely was very, uh, I would say, inspiring. And if I can take one more minute of your time, as a UN system, it is designed to work through the parties, as you rightly mentioned. But at the same time, in the world we live in, we cannot be not cognizant of the demand or the voices coming out from the general public. And I Absolutely. see also different UN organizations are also finding ways and are encouraging ways to engage with different stakeholders, not just through the parties. And yeah. I guess also the UNFCCC is trying to engage, for example, through Nairobi Work Program, for example, with the Academia uh, yeah, and so on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, so <laughs> can you, maybe for the audience, it could definitely be very interesting. What would be the possible policy footholds, if I can say? or avenues for people who are neither part of a party delegation as such, or within the formal system, how can they influence the climate change policy making process? Well, first, thanks very much, because one forgets to say, oh, by the way, this is what I do, and please come and participate. So on adaptation, um, what does it take to enhance adaptation to climate impact? Well, it takes a lot of things, but often, countries or even down, you know, sub-regional or municipalities don't actually know what to do. There's a lot of uncertainty. We're moving into a future that isn't here yet. And we know that it's changing. All of these 
things that used to be taken for granted in nature, they're, they're changing very much. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Some of the work that I lead at UNFCCC helps to fill those knowledge gaps and to convey information in a way that can enable governments to take, take action. And that Adaptation Knowledge Hub welcomes all of you um, to become partners. It's called the Nairobi Work Program. And Himanshu, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat once I stop talking. Um, but we would invite all of you to become partners. And what happens is the Nairobi Pro, uh, Work Program, this Adaptation Knowledge Hub, has um, essentially an ear to the ground. We're listening to what parties or what countries are telling us that they need. And we then convey that to all of you. And that can be really helpful because all of you are doing all of this great work in the world anyway. And we aligned that and then help bring that information back to countries. For example, there's a little bit of information about this neat stuff that you're doing. Um, you know, valuing biomes and ecosystems like coral reef ecosystems in the Caribbean as public infrastructure, and then finding ways to protect that through things like insurance and other measures. That's really intriguing for many countries, not just Mexico or countries in the Caribbean. And we help facilitate that learning. Of course, Marcelo, we have to do a better job at finding out what didn't work and finding ways to talk about that. That's totally essential. So become a partner, get involved. We have 10 thematic areas um, this year at COP26. We're gonna be highlighting work around biodiversity, particularly in grasslands and forests. In the past couple of years, we've been really focusing a lot on the ocean and marine ecosystems. Um, we'll be ramping up work on agriculture and food security from now onward. So, all of you, there's a place for you, your voice, your insights are needed, and we can link you up then to countries who can really benefit from what you know and help scale of adaptation. So that's one of dozens of ways to get involved. And we really do, you know, it's an all hands on deck moment. We need everybody's effort um, to build this hopefully climate resilient, sustainable future. Thank you so much, Coco. That definitely is helpful. And that's more like a teaser of what all can be done. So I would encourage on behalf of everyone, please get in touch with us. Please check the website. There are different forums and more than anything, all decks on the uh, all hands on the deck. So yes, thanks a lot, Coco. With this now, I would like to come to Zita. Zita and Simon, first of all, my apologies for keeping you waiting for such a long time. We have understood now the perspective from the private side from the social side of community participation and the policy making. Um, Zira, would you like to provide a take? I don't know whether a cautionary tale from the science perspective, when we talk about nature-based solution, are there limitations to it? Or are there certain areas that need more attention from your point of view? There had been cases we were discussing while preparing for the academy that you know nature-based solution is not the panacea that would fix everything. So are there certain questions that you would like to flag or is there anything else today? We would more than anything, we would like to inspire and foster some more climate action. So any hat you wanna wear, your IPCC hat, your UNU hat or your experience, your personal hat, please feel free. Thank you, Himanshu, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was thinking uh, what to bring after this very rich uh, uh, week of uh, discussions where so many different things has been already raised. And um, I decided to bring one example where I think that communication is actually key in the context of, of limitations that NBS solutions are facing. And um, um, I think many of you uh, remember the, the huge floods in, in China this July, uh, where one of the cities which was hardly hit was um, a so-called Spoint City. Um, thank you, and I, I'm really sorry, but because I'm sure my pronunciation is not correct here, but uh, uh, please forgive me. So what happened there? So it was uh, in the second half of July uh, this year, and um, the region uh, faced uh, several years of uh, several days of torrential rains. And this uh, triggered a massive uh, flooding uh, in the entire province of Hainan, including also Sengzhou city, which is uh, also called Spoint city. 
So um, this triggered a huge flooding, um, uh, especially in the low-lying areas, which overhand the stormwater drainage system of, of the urban area, including also the subway system, which, which led to, to several casualties and, and actually people uh, died, uh, died in that uh, situation. So the, the rainfall was really extraordinary and um, it, it was not, so to say, a, a, a normal uh, time of, uh, uh, type of rainfall, but, but um, the city planners actually prepared the nature-based solution, the Spoint City concept for. So um, this Spoint City is aimed to, to use natural processes to take up rainwater. And the Chinese government invested several billions of US dollars, in fact, uh, in this program since 2014 uh, to create several point cities uh, across uh, the nation. And uh, the overall goal was to, to um, um, have around 80% of annual pr uh, precipitation uh, taken up, retained, reused uh, by these new structures. So the city of Zhengzhou is one of these point cities and uh, invested a lot of money, actually billions of yuan, uh, in uh, uh, creating new structures, uh, which allows the city to deal better with flooding and, uh, and drainage. Um, so after this huge flooding event, uh, there have been several um, articles in the media, print, and also uh, in, in, in the news. Um, questioning uh, the uh, aim of, um, and, and also, so to say, uh, the meaningfulness of this huge investment and claiming that, uh, well, this event showed that um, the sponsored con uh, concept may be not working, actually. And uh, what struck me uh, back in time that uh, this um, one event, so to say, um, just questioned um, the overall validity of the Spon City concept. And um, uh, I am not working myself in China, so I, I have um, not a great deal of, of deep knowledge um, about uh, the situation. But uh, what is really important to, to raise here, and, and I think that's not related to China, but it's a global issue that nature-based solutions are designed for, for a certain type of uh, risk and risk reduction uh, purposes and uh, usually not designed to deal with extreme events. So there have been studies about mangrove forests and tsunamis, but uh, uh, essentially when we are talking about mangrove forests, we are rather uh, talking about erosion and uh, flood risk reduction, but um, uh, so I, I wouldn't, um, as, as Ali uh, Rizzi uh, from, uh, um, from IUCN always raises, I wouldn't want to have my family behind um, a mangrove forest if the tsunami is coming, right? So that's not the type of uh, uh, disaster you are actually uh, designing your nature-based solution for. And, and similar in the Spoint City context. So if you have a, a once in a hundred year um, type of flood, then it's uh, most likely not the nature-based solution alone, which will uh, save um, uh, lives, but you need to combine it with uh, other uh, measures, uh, um, with, with uh, warning, with uh, 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 upgraded uh, sewage system, which in combination with the with the nature-based solution will uh, help you to reduce your risk. And similarly, also with, with tsunamis. So if you would rely on me on mangrove forest, then I really wouldn't want to have my family uh, behind that forest. So um, for me, this this um, the message I would like to, to convey here that uh, um, when we are talking about nature-based solutions, it's absolutely necessary that we communicate the purpose um, and the limits uh, correctly. So um, otherwise, if something like uh, uh, this happens, like in, in China, the entire uh, meaningfulness and utility of the concept is questions, which is um, not just and not justified because the Spoin City concept was not designed uh, to, to deal with such an extreme uh, flood event. And with that, I would like to close. I, I think it's an important uh, issue, uh, and I hope that uh, some of the follow-up conversations uh, uh, might uh, take this also into consideration. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Zita. That definitely was a very valid point. 
no solution is a silver bullet. It's about you know a wide range of contextualized solution. And uh, I don't remember where exactly from it is ringing bell in my mind, but there is like a saying that we need to be successful all the time and they need uh, we need to fail only once to show that we are a failure sort of. So this message of community trust of communication is very, very important, particularly in this time when you know the scientific knowledge and the way we have been organizing ourselves since Second World War is being questioned more and more. So I think flagging the limitation of a particular solution and saying that there is only so much we can do, for example, with nature-based solution. But there, at the same time, there is only so much we can do, for example, with seawalls. So each solution has its own limitation and application. So the context matter, participation matter. If I can synthesize you know, the core takeaways from your message. Thanks a lot uh, for that. I would like to come to you when time allows, maybe towards the IPCC and some of your key insights from there on nature-based solution maybe in the second part. But now we would like to talk to Simone. Simone, thanks a lot for waiting. You are, I would say, the core speaker here. You bring with you a wealth of experience from in from urban areas across the world be it in europe be in latin america in southeast asia and so on and i'm pretty sure you quite must be happy to hear you know the participatory approaches from india the coral reef participant program from mexico how do you think a transformative urbanization when we talk about let not just limit ourselves to nature-based solution obviously nature-based solution is our focus but when we talk about climate action how urban areas can be transformative. And I think this is something you also lead at, transformative urban, uh, urbanizations. So what would be your message for us? Thanks, Himanshu, and, and thanks everyone for the, the very inspiring uh, input, particularly from Marcel and, and Fernando, that was very, very informative. And I, I, while you were talking, I had tried to structure my thoughts and even restructure them a little bit. Um, so I think my, my key takeaways, let me try to sum it up in, in three key points. So I guess we all agree we need to, to change towards this uh, better understanding living with nature as Coco has put it. And that might be particularly challenging in urban areas, which we very often see as these concrete jungles uh, where nature at best is, is rather something around and then not within. So that certainly needs to change. And um, now before coming to those three points, we, that, that all reminded me of, of an anecdote I just want to tell, because, you know, I, I was trained as an architect and urban planner. And um, well, now I ended up in research, uh, which is, uh, great. On the other hand, sometimes I envy my former colleagues and classmates with whom I studied and who have become actual urban planners and really do the constructions, do work on the ground. And a couple of years ago, I met one of my friends again, and he was super enthusiastic and showed me a very nice design and said, okay, listen, look what we did. And we convinced them to, to construct those houses and have those many apartments, have habitation for those many people. And then I looked at the plan and was like, but you build it in a retention area. And that reminded me that in throughout my architectural urban planning studies, we hardly learned about environment. We hardly learned about climate. Obviously that's been a couple of years ago and that might've changed today, but I still think there's a lot of silos we need to break, including in education, including in capacity sharing, capacity development. And I think that that's my first key message. Um, just bringing together this, these many people from those many backgrounds today in the academy will help tremendously in knowing and sharing knowledge, sharing how has it worked actually, how, how did we manage to introduce this nature-based thinking in, into urban development and then that on its own can, can trigger a transformation and in, in thinking urban areas differently, not as something being apart from nature, but being part of it, being a fundamental place. Uh, we, we can't uh, think our globe without it. I mean, more than half of the world's population is living in cities, obviously. So we need to break those silos between disciplines, but, but also between regions by sharing that knowledge and by coming together and also knowing what is feasible. And also, as Dita has put it, where's the limitations? Where, where do we need to link uh, different types of measures? Where do we link uh, 
construction, uh, like gray infrastructure to green infrastructure. And that, and that's the second point, would require an uptake across society, not only by decision makers, of course, they're very important, but also by different societal groups, I guess that's what Marcella has shown us so beautifully. All those nature-based approaches and all that uh, urban transformation towards being more sustainable, being uh, zero carbon, then someday in future, this will only work if we have everyone on board, if we have all hands on deck, as has already been said, right? So we can't do that only with half of the population. Uh, if we only consider the males because females are not part of the decision-making, we can't either do it if it's only a top-down decision, which is excluding, for instance, marginalized groups as informal dwellers in urban areas because they're an important part of the society. So um, we need this, uptake and for that I feel we also need and can uh, build upon the multiple benefits of nature-based solutions so that of course the direct benefits like for disaster risk reduction for climate change adaptation but also those benefits or co-benefits depending on how it is designed for sustaining livelihoods for local communities who depend on on those uh, services like fishery communities who depend on a healthy ecosystem we might depend on a coastal mangrove system which at the same time would protect the coastlines we depend on reefs to protect coastal cities as has been shown not only for touristic approach but also for others and that requires, and that's the third point, a mind shift. We need to shift our minds towards this integrated understanding of thinking people together with environment. And for that, we do not need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to consider that by putting together the small bits and pieces, different measures, not only one, but in a holistic and a systemic approach, that that might be the way forward. And uh, yeah, we need new coalitions to be built for it, right? And that's what we are now working on and we'll be working on for the next years in you and you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Simone, definitely. I mean, I very much enjoyed your emphasis starting on education. That is the fundamental, if you ask me the first, um, that, that is what I share as well, you know, starting from education. It is a generational question. We have to start not only with the generation that is in charge, but the generation that is going to be in the charge. So thanks a lot, Simone, for bringing that together for us. So now I would like to request all of our speakers if they can kindly switch on their cameras. And uh, Fernando, if I can, come back to your presentation because I find it very exciting from my own knowledge as well. We also see a lot of interest coming from the audience. You have answered one question that I had put for you. Maybe we take it that back uh, you know, slightly that how do you actually assess the impact of, for example, any particular scheme, be it insurance? And the second thing um, that I wanted to ask you, which is a bit more broad, not necessarily confined only to insurance, is uh, we need all hands on the deck. So how do can we ensure that the private sector, if you would like to speak from that perspective, can be more involved in the climate action? Where, how do we bring different actors together, not necessarily a particular actor in you know, a private sector, but just how, how for you, in what in your understanding would be participatory planning and how would it work? Thank you. OK, thank you, Hima. So in terms of how do we measure that, there are two ways of measuring this. One is the instrument. I mean, did the insurance actually pay when you need it? And at least we had the proof last year of that, that yes, it paid. Maybe we can improve the design and maybe we can change the parameters of uh, the, the trigger. The, the... And actually they will change. We changed them this year and they, there were some adjustments. In... So any insurance can be fine tuned, I would say because it was the very first one. So we kept it simple at the beginning. That was the recommendation for insurance companies. And now it's more sophisticated. There are more layers of, pay, of payments and then, uh, yeah, so adjust to, to the differences. So that's one way. Second way to measure is, okay, what do you do with the money? <laughs> so in this case, we have these brigades, as I mentioned, and collecting and stabilizing the debris and, and the fragments, and there are also some restoration projects. How are we going to measure the impact of those responses is how many colonies actually survive, how the life water cover is recovered, but also we have some control sites where we don't do any intervention and assess if they're going to recover faster or, or less or, or, or that. No? So we have the biological and ecological monitoring, but also the financial monitoring, I would say. No? In terms of how to involve the private sector, and um, the hotel owners and the coastal property owners in the Mexico 
in Caribbean, they recognize slowly, <laughs> I would say for the last 10, 15 years, that yeah, the reefs and the dunes and the mangroves are important for the businesses. So if, I mean, if they lose all of that, probably not everybody's in the same page. And thanks God we have some uh, champions in the area that actually are really aware of that. They, they invest in dune restoration, for example, or they invest in reef restoration and they recognize the importance of insurance. So that's critical to have some first the evidence that the natural systems protect the coastal area in this case, there are some benefits to them and some champions that actually in, uh, embrace that concept and actually talk to their peers because thanks God, some of them are, are small hotels, also big hotels, big corporations, not international corporations. Mostly they are Mexicans who actually live there for 20, 30 years and they have learned that because the corporations who come from overseas to buy a hotel for three, five, 10 years, they don't get attachment to the site. So it's important to have these champions which can talk to them later. So that's the, the what well, we have experienced here. Yeah, the evidence, the relationship with the site in this case, and the awareness that, yeah, the businesses depend on the health of the system. And yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Fernando. Your message on, you know, the sense of belongingness, the sense of association and the sense of collective future. That is very, very key to you. Because once we know we all are in this together, we definitely work together as well. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, before I come to you, Marcel, I would like to flag for Coco, Simone and Zita that you three have been there with us throughout the Academy from the day one to day three. So we would come to you towards the end as your final one minute message for the core participants of the Academy, if there are certain areas in your experience where we should focus a bit more on, or for, to the general audience, what we can do better to enhance our climate action, what we can do to enhance our climate action in the community where we are associated with. So that is what we would come to you. But before that, Marcela, thanks a lot for your amazing presentation. It was very, very helpful. And at the same time, I would say it provided many ideas to many of us. Um, my question for you, again, feel free to take it or any other point that you would like to bring is that what in your um, experience has been the key for successful participation at the very local level? If there are one or two things, whether it is communication, I don't know, designing the program, I, I'm just throwing some stuff from the top of my mind. And the second thing is, what are the things to avoid? You also mentioned learning from failures. I mean, unfortunately, we did not do not have that much time to hear about that. But if there is something that you would like to share. Can you please repeat your first question? Okay, so the first question was, what in your experience so far has been the key for successful particip participatory process, be it participatory planning, climate action. And second was more related to failures, learning from failures. What are the things to avoid? I got that. Uh, with regard to participation, uh, I have to say that um, right from the time when we started our work 30 years ago, uh, we began as the capacity building agency for the Indo-German Watershed Development Program, where we engaged NABAD, was working with the KFW and we together with the GIZ. It was totally new in India. And it was for the first time what, where actually communities had to come together. So the, at that time, it was the program where we were responsible for designing the program, designing the participatory uh, uh, capacity building aspects. So that was where we, design, we designed it such that we put the community at the center and it was a learning for all of us. You know, how do we get the community to select their members to be decision makers, to come and rub shoulders together, particularly because in India here, besides the class barrier, we have the caste barrier. We have communities, tribal communities within the caste community segregated. And we had to bring everybody together. What did the trick for us was that we took up the issue of a very burning problem. It was the degraded lands. It was uh, the water scarcity that everybody experienced and the repeated droughts. We began it in areas where the, water, where the rainfall 450 meter, millimeters on an average per year and very often much lower. 
So when we took up the burning issue, it was everybody in the village who felt it. So that became a good rally point to start the program. And then getting the people together to talk together, to rub shoulders in working together. Uh, we had criteria of ownership where the village had to put in a certain measurable amount. It was 16% uh, and now it is 20% of measurable local contribution. It had to come from communities, excluding the landless poor, single-headed women households. These were excluded. Everybody else had to put in a, 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 the, a, the work, the contribution. And they had to work together, rubbing shoulders together. So literally, that brought out a whole participatory approach. And then the next important point was all records were kept with the community. We had the responsibility of training the community, educating them on the account keeping, on sharing the, uh, on giving reports to the, uh, to the village, on giving payment to the village, on receiving monies into their account. And mind you, all this was foreign monies. Um, I don't know how much it would work out in, in uh, uh, USD or euros. It would be something like the community at that time in the year uh, 96, 97, 98, they were receiving one crore into the bank account of the village development committee, not heard of. And we were responsible to see that the accounts were well maintained, records were well maintained, that the uh, uh, reports were given. You know, so it put a lot of um, uh, pressure on us, but very good pressure. It got us to put good systems of accountability at all levels with the, with the uh, villagers. I think that was one of the big breakthroughs. So people could feel the money. It was given to them. They were giving the accounts. They could be questioned by the villagers. Now that made a big change. So, you know, for me, that was one of the big learnings we had. And we were accountable at all levels to the village, to the government of India, because this was foreign money coming in, excluded from the FCRA. But, you know, it had to be, we had to report to CAG and everywhere which put systems in place, you know, and that built the trust. Thank you so much, Marcella. No, definitely, again, if I can try to find the keywords out there is that don't be afraid of talking about the most pressing challenge, however big it is, and keep transparency. Transparency yeah. propagates trust, and winning the trust is the key. So thanks a lot, and I fully share your concern with all the budgetary you know reporting and all it can be very arduous to say the list uh thanks a lot um with this coco towards the very end of this academy what would be again the same question i had on day one either your wish list or your key message for all of us for the core group of participants for everyone out there who is who has spent i guess maybe 10 hours or even longer over the last week listening to us listening to our uh, inputs how can we do it better whatever we do thanks himanshi this has been a super interesting week and i've learned a lot listening <laughs> since you challenged us to say just one really crisp thing it would be show us how all of you, um, and I'm going to decompose that show. Um, don't tell us, show us, please. And when I say us, I mean international climate policy. We need case studies. We need to be shown how humans can live in a different way with nature. Simona, I, I just appreciated everybody, of course, but Simona, since you just recently spoke, I really appreciated how you were exploring some of the dilemmas like Zeta was of how people live as part of nature in an urban environment, which up until now we've mostly thought of as a non-natural environment where how do we bring in nature? How do we make sure that cities aren't too hot? Does it mean we live underground in the future? I'm sort of making that up, but only sort of when you see the types of regional heat um, domes that we've experienced just in the past two or three years at almost 50 degrees Celsius or just about that. So show, show us how, please show us the difficulties, show us the ins and outs, illustrate how the future is here now. Um, it, it is here now, that's how trends emerge. But of course the future isn't everywhere. So please 
bring your knowledge, help countries figure out how to make nature part of the equation of avoiding dangerous anthropogenic climate change and keeping society resilient. Thanks a lot, Coco. Uh, Zita, your final remarks. Thank you very much. Um, but it's important to me at the end of this week to, to raise uh, that uh, it's really um, nature-based solutions, that its capacity to, to help us to adapt and to reduce disaster risk is really intertwined with our action or inaction towards reducing emissions. So if we do not succeed um, to uh, substantially reduce our emissions, we will really compromise many of these nature-based solutions, which will not be available uh, for us anymore. So it's kind of a double lose uh, situation. So whenever we are talking about nature-based solutions, we are talking about them um, in, in that temperature, temperature range we are um, now and maybe in the, least, uh, in the recent future. But if we really leave that um, temperature boundary, um, many of these solutions will not help us anymore. And um, I think on Monday, I brought the example of coral reefs, which are um, at uh, extreme threat already by 1.5 degree um, global warming and um, uh, virtually non-existent with, uh, uh, with, with two degree uh, global warming. So for me, it's a very important message because we shouldn't kind of pin our hopes on nature-based solutions, it's it's not a substitute for mitigation. We need to reduce our uh, emissions. And if we do so, then nature-based solutions will be able to help us uh, to reduce uh, risk, um, to improve food and water security, to, to adapt. But um, it's uh, we, we need to do uh, that extra mile. And um, that's an important point for me. Thank you. Definitely. I could not have agreed more with you. Dita, thanks a lot for underlining that. Simon, last and final words from the academy side. They come and, to but you. no pressure, right? No pressure. <laughs> uh, maybe just building upon what Zita, Zita just said, it's that we, we need to, this we does include all of us. And I feel nature-based approaches are that there's entry points for pretty much everyone like it's it's not only environmentalists who should deal with it it is it's urban decision makers it is um every urban and when you're talking about urban areas it's every inhabitant right who could who likes to enjoy going to parks and gardens who can water plants who sustains on urban agriculture so and it's also uh, it's also psychologists who can support us with the like environmental uh, consideration with the uh, perception we have uh, with um, improved uptake. So it's, it's a whole of society approach that we definitely need here. And um, that's why I'm enjoying this panel so much because no one has asked who has which disciplinary or regional background. We're working on the same topic because we believe in it. Thank you, indeed. Indeed, we believe in it. Exactly. That's, that's, I would guess that sums up the whole academy program, and that is what we would be now listening from Christian. So thanks a lot to all our panelists. Thanks a lot to all the attendees for your kind words and time. We very much appreciate. So Christian, now we come to you for, again, Foundation's perspective on the academy your experience so far and what would be your message to all of us. And before I conclude, thanks from my side and maybe a very really advanced promotion for the next year. This year we focused on nature-based solution. Next year we would be talking about digitalization, something very transformative and something quite happening. So keep, do follow our social media channels and we would talk about that maybe hopefully in 10 months from now. But for now, Christian, um, all everything to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is really a pleasure to have the last role here and to be the very last uh, contributor to the, this forum. Thank you very much, Fernando, Marcella, Simone, Sita and Coco for your inputs. And um, also for me, I have to say that this was a very intense week with a total of eight public seminars and workshops. And we got authentic and interesting insights into case studies and approaches of NBS in more than, I think it was over 30 presentations and talks. So quite a lot. 
Um, when I look at it, NBS seems somehow compellingly logical at first glance when you look into them. They are often more cost effective than gray pure, uh, pure gray measures. They often fulfill multiple goals, be it climate adaptation, disaster risk reduction, or even a healthier urban climate. And in the best case, they can even provide livelihood options. So the question is, why are they not available everywhere and by everyone? Because we also learned about the hurdles and challenges that exist. For me, the following hurdles stuck particularly clearly. One major challenge seems to be the scaling of the small pilot projects. And I, I think we had it a little bit throughout the week here as well. We heard a lot of a small pilot projects, but not so much about real large scale endeavors. And here, um, there's often a lack of necessary capital and long-term financing, especially if the pilot project is NGO or donor funded, then we might run into the scaling project uh, problems. Another issue is the lack of background knowledge among many decision makers, what we also heard today from Marcella. In our climate commu academy community, so all of us, NBS seems quite logical. However, for urban planners with a more traditional education, they are not yet part of the standard toolkit. So we have to make it a standard in this toolkit, like Simone has said in her final words as well. So further training is urgently needed. And I think the Climate Academy can close this gap a little bit by inviting people from all disciplines. A third challenge, which was also frequently emphasized by our academy participants, is the involvement of all stakeholders affected. So also the people on the ground. NBS often face e.g. land use conflicts with other things, especially in cities where space is scarce. A decision-making process for a new measure must therefore be found together with all affected residents. Otherwise, for all its advantages, the NBS threatens rejection by the population. And this is also what Marcella has said, you must clearly showcase the concrete benefits, not only for the community, but also for everyone within the communities so on an individual level. This can only happen with participatory approaches. So we as organizers hope that you found the workshops and presentations interesting and that you derive some benefit from them for your own work. We also hope that we were able to show how important an interdisciplinary exchange is. And this is why we continue with the academies. We would also like to express our sincere gratitude to all the contributors, our academy participants, the behind the scenes supporters, and of course, all the speakers for this week. I would also like to mention ICLEI here, who supported us with a special workshop on Wednesday. And of course, my thanks again goes to our colleagues from UNU and UNFCCC, Himanshu, Simone, Sita, and Coco. What can I say at last? We will post all the results of the Academy online starting next week, because we also said that knowledge sharing is important. And if you're still up for another on the ground project, check out our risk award website. This year, the Munich Re Foundation began supporting a mangrove project in Vietnam, which we think is a very nice case study again, not really large scale, but it can improve or can grow. And the project there serves um, prevention or disaster prevention against floods and storms. This was just the last commercial break. Um, I invite you to just stay tuned, have a look at our websites of UNU and Munich Re Foundation. We will keep you posted with all the next ideas, workshops about the Climate Academy and further projects. And having said that, I wish all of you a wonderful and healthy weekend wherever you are in the world and hope to see you in person somewhere in the future. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.